Thank you, Rofi. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very proud to have Jan Vitas today in the Biodiversity Seminar. Um, Jan Vitas is from the Research Unit uh, Forest Dynamics at WSL. I offered to introduce him, but actually then Jan said I will introduce myself on the first slide. So I take the opportunity and say a few personal words. So um, I met Jan the first time a few years ago when we were searching for a postdoc uh, in the, in the for Swiss Forest Lab project, Extreme Adapt. And Jan was in the final round that we, uh, for candidates that we selected. And he was actually by far the best candidate. Um, but we were hesitating to take him a little bit because the problem was that Jan was actually too advanced for this postdoc. So he had already done several postdocs. He had, we knew he applied for assistant professorships and uh, group leader positions. So we actually were hesitating to choose him because we thought if we choose him after one or two months, he will disappear again. Finally, we, we decided to take the risk and uh, it was worth the risk because I think uh, one year later after the project Extreme Adapt started, he got offered a tenure track position in Arthur Gessler's lab and he took it. And now we actually, if Jan will perform well the next few years and he likes the position at VSL, we will have the pleasure to, uh, to work with him for the next few years, I hope. So the future is quite bright in this respect. Moreover, Jan had one more convincing argument why we should choose him as a postdoc. He told us that he plays regularly badminton uh, in a club, and we were actually looking for a badminton player to play, sing play singles and doubles here at VSL. So that was a very convincing argument, and the result is that we now go regularly playing badminton over lunch. And uh, he's a really good player. He's, a, he's probably the best player I've ever seen playing in front at the net. His weakness is probably hitting hard at the from the back, I would say. But actually, that's cool because it reflects a bit his personality. So Jan is really a silent, but very convincing guy that doesn't need loud words uh, to, to, to be convincing. So I really enjoy uh, working together with him in several projects in the meantime. So Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, uh, Chris, for this nice introduction. I'm happy that intro I introduced myself so that you can say some personal words. This is much more meaningful for me. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, so when you uh, invited me, I directly accepted it because it was from you. And uh, actually, just afterwards, I thought that maybe my research scope doesn't fit at all with uh, biodiversity seminars. But finally, I found really a, a good, I think, storyline that should match this uh, biodiversity seminar. So hello, everyone. I share my screen. Um, this one. Shall I um, switch the slides? Or the, it's perfect. No, it's perfect. Okay, good. So, uh, welcome to my talk. So, this is about adapt, move, or die species specific responses to global warming with a special focus on trees, but not only. That will be on many different uh, taxonomic groups. Uh, as I said, I can introduce myself first for those who don't know me. Uh, I come from the southwest of France in Bordeaux, where I started to study uh, plant communities along the Atlantic dunes uh, for my master project. And from there, I, I started for my research uh, activities, I started to climb up the mountains. So at first, I uh, did my PhD on Pyrenees, working on trees along elevation and gradients. So that was from the sea level to uh, like, let's say 1600 meters. And I was working on tree phenology along uh, elevation and gradients. Then I moved to Switzerland for my first postdoc with Christian Kerner uh, for four years. Oh, there's a misspelling for at the University of Basel in Switzerland, um, where I studied the upper elevational limits of trees. So even a bit higher until the tree line so around 2,000 to 300 meters. And then I did a second postdoc in Davos on alpine plants, so beyond the tree line. Uh, 
And after that, I did another short postdoc in climatology, and I studied also the snow, um, uh, how the snow has changed over the years. So I was like always climbing up the mountains, and now I, I'm back to my original, uh, uh, let's say, elevation range. <laughs> and studying more uh, forest ecology since 2018 uh, as a senior researcher at USF. So I don't want to start with climate change because first you are very well informed about it. Um, and second, I think it's really a small part of the big picture the species are, are facing uh, at the moment. So species are living in what we call the Anthropocene. And I like to, to see this uh, picture from satellites that shows the light uh, uh, of the Earth at night, because it, then it helps to realize how much, how big is the influence of human activities. Uh, and you see there are not so much space, uh, especially in Europe or North America, where the species uh, are not too much disturbed by human activities. And they don't, the species don't have to deal only with human activities or with us, but they also have to deal with uh, uh, an increase, a tremendous increase of our activities. Um, so on the left, you have the physical parameters of the Earth that is changing. You all know, I don't know if you see my mouse, but the greenhouse gases. And uh, that increased a lot, but uh, also other things like uh, the loss of tropical forest or ocean acidification. And it's not only that, there is also socioeconomic trends that are changing dramatically since the 1950s. So that's what we call the Great Acceleration, where you have the population that increase exponentially, um, paper production or telecommunication, transportations, and so on. So that was just the background of, uh, of, uh, of this talk. Um, I propose you to four topics for this talk. Um, so as it was presented on my first slide, the species have to move to, to migrate or to die. So my first chapter will be about the species on the move. And I will take some examples showing how the different taxonomy groups are moving up in the mountains over the last decades. Then I will give some example of local extinction, extinction and not only the rare age of the distribution of the species. We will see that this also happened at the leading age. Uh, for adaptation on, in the census uh, latos on the larger meaning, uh, I will talk about how phenological shift manage or allows the species to track uh, partly climate change. And uh, because my recent research, I'm more and more interested by uh, trophic interactions. I would also like, uh, I would attempt to, to talk about the phenological mismatches and how phenological shifts uh, are um, uh, shaping species coexistence. So let's talk first on the species on the move. So there has been a lot of studies in the recent uh, years that shows that species are moving up in latitudes and in uh, elevation uh, for many group of species like birds, plants, even fishes. Um, what I would like to, to show you today is a recent uh, meta-analysis I, I was conducting um, uh, recently. Um, because this is all focused on the European Alps and the, the idea is to, to quantify how much the species are moving up uh, the mountain only in the Alps for different taxonomy groups. So what I did is that I used the published and unpublished data from citizen science. So like the network of Infofona, Vogelwarte or Fenovalt at ESL. Uh, I included studies that have at least 10 years uh, over the last 30 years. And I would uh, included all the countries that share a, a part of the European Alps. So which means uh, Austria, Germany, France, Italy, for example. And from all these studies I extracted for every species, so at a species level, the rate of uh, upward shift observed per decade. And so, as I told, the idea was to quantify this shift and also to, to check whether the upward shift uh, is tracking the, the speed of climate warming. 
Uh, so what is the speed of climate warming in the Alps? Here yeah, it's a graph that shows uh, for six stations from various elevation from uh, 1300 meters to 2500 meters, how the temperature has changed over the, or since 1970. And as you can see, uh, the temperature has increased by 0.36 degrees every 10 years. And that corresponds if you use a common lapse rate uh, of the temperature decline with elevation that would correspond around 70 meters every 10 years, which means that the species should uh, track the 70 meters every 10 years if they want to stay in the same climate as before. And the snow free period has also increased quite a lot by nine days every 10 years which correspond more than a month of uh, a month where you don't have any snow um, on the ground. Okay, and I, I forgot to say, I also focused on the leading edge and uh, the optimum um, edge, uh, the optimum, um, uh, let's say, where you have the, the peak of abundance of the species and the leading edge, so at the upper elevation and limits of the species. I focused on these two limits. So yeah, I don't want you to go into the, this table because it's just uh, too small anyway. It's just to show you that I included uh, quite some diverse taxonomic groups, um, like, uh, so for plants, I have more than 1,000 species. And I have about 500 species for animals that includes uh, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and fishes, and also more than 100 species of fungi. And here are the results. So of all these different studies, this is um, the result from the mixed effect model using the studies as a random effect. Uh, you have here the elevational shift per decade for every taxonomic group. So, which means if it's positive, you have an upward shift of that group. Um, so, what you see is that overall, you have a kind of positive shift for most of them, but it gets significant only for insects, woody plants, and herbaceous plants. Uh, the rest is not really significant. You have quite huge standard deviation because sometimes we have too few studies. Uh, but overall, we have an upward shift of around 20 meters per decade. And the lowest changes were found for birds, uh, for ferns, and aquatic insects, or semi-aquatic insects, like um, dragonflies or damselflies. Um, another interesting thing is that you can see that the migration is well below the pace of climate warming. The climate warming pace is, uh, was estimated at 70 meters per decade. So that's a red vertical line. Yeah. So they are all like below. So they are changing, they are moving up, but they are uh, lagging the pace or the, the rate of climate warming. And of course, we have also a high variability within taxa, but I will come back to that a bit later. Um, that was for the optimum elevation for the leading edge, so the upper elevation and limits. Um, we got quite uh, more pronounced trends. So we have still a migration to higher elevation for almost all organisms, uh, but again, not for semi-aquatic insects, uh, interestingly. Um, what we can also see is that the animals uh, have moved more than uh, the plants. Um, so on average, 76 meters per decade for all animals, the plants have moved only by 15 meters per decade. And we have again a high variability within taxa. Uh, what we can also say again is that uh, the migration rate, rate is uh, well below the rate of climate change for plants, but for animals at this leading edge, they are almost matching the climate velocity. Uh, I just told you we had a high variability within taxa. So this is really true and especially for insects. If we look a bit closer for the different groups or different orders uh, within insects, we see, for example, that the coleoptera, the lepidoptera, so the butterfly, the mouse, and uh, the beetles, for example, they, um, they moved up upward uh, faster than like the orthoptera, 
uh, the grasshoppers and the crickets, for example. Both at the optimum and at the leading edge uh, of the distribution. Uh, and again, we found no shift for the odonata, so like the damsel flies and dragon flies. And that we think might be related to, um, to the habitat. Uh, so it's maybe much harder to move from when you are really bound to a specific habitat like ponds uh, in the alpine climate, because the ponds are not moving up and you have to find back the same habitat that could take quite long. Uh, especially at the leading edge um, to create this new habitat because the plants has to colonize first uh, some uh, area where you have uh, enough water and, and so on. So that might be a reason why these uh, animals are not moving up too much. Uh, let's have a look to the trees and what those uh, or what the species di distribution model says. Um, so here yeah, it's typical or classical species distribution models that we call potential climatic niche model that predict the, suita the climate suitability of uh, the species uh, in the future. You may have seen these maps already. So it's an example of Cecil Oak and Hornbeam uh, trees, how they are, uh, how their current or their climate uh, is going to change in the future. So it's only based on the current distribution of the species and how they are statistically correlated to different climatic uh, parameters. Uh, and those models um, predict a potential expansion and upward shift of the species in Switzerland quite, uh, quite fast, actually. Uh, we have seen that they are not moving that fast uh, before, at least well below the, the pace of climate warming. And this is most likely due to uh, demographic processes and competition. Here, uh, so it's a study from Daniel Scherer using the, the tree media model from um, IK Lichte. Um, and this, is, this shows nicely that if you, you simulate the prediction of the upper elevation limits of different trees, uh, let's say in 2000, 2060, and 2085, and you compare using the trimming model, that is a process-based model that use competition, demographic processes, even dispersal abilities. If you compare with a classical uh, species distribution model, you don't find the same. You, you will have a lag. Uh, if we take the example of 2060, we have a lag of 42 years uh, between the two models. So uh, the, the trimming model predict a much slower a shift of the species than the, the classical uh, niche models. And this is due to a demographic process. Uh, the trees uh, are long-lived organisms, so it takes time to establish, for example, and uh, due also to competition. Um, in the Alps, you have, for example, spruce that makes a, a big competition with uh, by making a lot of shade for the species that wants to move up. Uh, upward. Uh, so that corresponds actually quite well with what we observed because we observed that the, the trees are moving up but much slower than the, the climate is moving up. Okay, I now move on to my second part about the local extinction of uh, populations. This is of course expected at the rare age of uh, the distribution, so at the warm age uh, margin of species distribution. I found this study that, uh, that review many papers um, uh, that focused on the distribution of the species and looked at how much they, it has changed at different parts of the margin. And this study or this review found uh, quite a lot of uh, already uh, local extinction at the rare age of the margin. So they found uh, in almost half or 47% of the older species surveyed. And in all taxonomy groups, actually for plants, insects, fish, amphibians, birds, mammals, with not so much differences among the taxa. They also found, so I didn't put the graphs here, but they found also that you have a higher local extinctions rate in tropical compared to temperate areas. And you found this uh, local extinction both along elevational and latitudinal gradients. 
Okay. But my point is that it's not only occurring at the at the warm age of the species distribution, so at the rare age, but also at the leading age, especially in mountains. So here yeah, it's a nice study uh, that has been conducted in Peru, was published in PNAS, PNAS in 2018. That shows a distribution of uh, three birds, or it's an example of three birds, but they have studied much more birds. Um, one which is like uh, a low elevation birds, uh, then an intermediate birds and a specialized birds for a high, um, uh, high elevation habitats. And they did a survey in 1985 and then a new survey 40 years, 40, um, years later, so four decades later. And they found uh, like the, the low elevation of birds they expanded quite some its range, so by 20% around, uh, and it was moving up. The intermediate bird has also, uh, uh, when it went also upward, um, but it, the range contracted quite a lot by uh, two thirds, so quite impressive. And the uh, high elevation of birds, then they didn't find it anymore in 2017. So just to, to show that uh, at the leading edge, because you lose some habitat by climate warming, because the mountains are most likely conic uh, shape, they have a conic shape. So when the climate gets warmer, you would lose uh, a, a space with the same climate. Um, so what happens in, in Europe for alpine plants that are specialized to high elevations? Actually, we didn't find an extinction of uh, alpine species, but rather the opposite. We have an increase of the biodiversity uh, in most of the peak mountain peaks in Europe. And this is very interesting because we would have expected the opposite, but actually we have a kind of what we call thermophilization, where the species from lower elevation, they, they, they go upwards while the specialized species are still occurring there. So they coexist at the moment, they still coexist the low and the high elevation of species, which increase the biodiversity. But actually this paper, so it was led by Steinbauer, uh, it was in Nature and uh, Sonia Whip was the last author. Um, yeah, actually what they say and what I agree is that this is most likely a transient uh, phenomena uh, that hides the accumulation of what is a so-called extinction depth, because uh, there is a certain lag of, of the, the, there is a certain lag for that the species um, get extinct. Uh, at the moment, they are coexisting, but probably uh, later uh, we will observe quite some massive extinctions of uh, specialized species. species. Um, yeah, I, I found this study also quite interesting. It's, it shows that for mountains area, uh, we have to take into account the shape of the mountains. Um, every chain of mountains have a different shape. In Europe, it's like a cone, which means that when the temperature increases, you lose a lot of uh, space. Uh, so the example is here for the Alps. On the right, you have the graph in green when you simulate two degree increase and you see that with two degree increase, you will lose uh, quite a lot of uh, space of habitat uh, with the same climate because of this conic shape of the European Alps. But some mountains like the Rocky Mountains are diamond uh, shape, which means that a species that has a quite low elevation margin. At the beginning, they will even expand the, the space suitable with the same climate. But of course, with further warming, they will also lose a little bit more. But that makes the Alps very sensitive to climate warming because of the shape of, of these mountains. Um, let's take now the example of forest trees in Europe at the rare age, uh, the, the niche model predict also um, a decrease of climate suitability of, uh, of uh, certain species like beech, 
or Scott pines. So species that are quite profitable for timber industry and more favorable and more favorable climate for oaks uh, and Mediterranean species. And if we look at the example here, uh, actually where I come from, from Southwest France or in Pyrenees uh, in the Spanish side, uh, that corresponds quite well with what is uh, currently observed. So there is a study here from Peñuelas in 2007 showing that um, uh, Orm Oaks, so Quercus ilex, is replacing a beach at the lower elevations and beaches uh, climbing up the mountains at the moment. And where I come from, it's also very obvious that um, Quercus ilex is expanding a lot. Um, uh, the range where normally you have uh, the other oaks like Quercus pyrenaica or Quercus petraia or Quercus uh, robur. So this is already happening, maybe much slower than what predict the models, but this is happening. Um, another uh, example at the rare age of the mountain. This is a new study uh, from a PhD student that was a last paper uh, of a PhD at the University of Greifswald. It's Lena Mufler. Uh, she did a very nice reciprocal transplant experiments uh, where we collected the seeds of nine population of beech from the south to the northern part of uh, the anti distribution of beech. And we planted all these seeds in the same environment or in the same um, uh, site that where the seeds come from, plus two extra sites uh, beyond the, the distribution of the species at the south and at the north. And what, um, what she was looking for is to look at the germination and the establishment um, to see how much the reg natural reg regeneration of each uh, is limited at uh, different parts of the distribution. What we found is that there is a high plasticity in the early life history trait. So the germination went very well uh, in any site and whatever the source, the provenance is, with some maternal effect due to the seed size. Uh, that may allow for short term acclimatization at the cold distribution margin. But at the warm margin, uh, she, she found that it could be uh, limited because uh, after two years, the establishment was really bad uh, towards uh, the dry margin, even from the local populations. So that would be another, uh, maybe proof that uh, the rare age would be uh, quite, um, um, yeah, it would be quite limited for the natural regeneration in the future, at least for beach trees. Okay, now I move on to my third part about adaptations through phenological shifts. I found this uh, very recent studies a few months ago in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution that shows that um, the range of the species can stay uh, the same by uh, just phenological shifts. So here you have the, the black uh, square. Uh, at the trailing age, for example, and at the leading age. And this gray square means that they can stay at the same place uh, thanks to phenological shift. So the phenological shift may allow the species to persist in situ. Uh, or even beyond the range, if you get later phenology here, you can also expand it beyond the range. This is a white uh, box here. Yeah. And I'm, I will not talk about the black boxes that if you want to um, um, to stay, you can also alternatively uh, uh, make genetic adaptations, but that's not the focus of this talk, which is also quite interesting anyway. Um, yeah, I made a quite uh, easy scheme to understand it better. Um, let's take an example of a tree with a certain growing season from spring to autumn. Uh, we know from dendroecology that there, there is an optimal growth period, uh, usually in early spring or in spring and early summer, that's the best period to grow. Uh, let's say that this tree has an optimal window of temperature. If you average the temperature where it grows the most is let's say around 15 degrees. And now if we apply a warming of like two degrees, 
uh, how the species or how the individual can track these changes by changing the phenologies by getting earlier. It may track the window of temperature, this 15 degree um, of temperature. It can still keep this window of optimal temperature by just being earlier in phenology. So that's a way to, to track uh, partly climate change. But of course, it's not exactly the same as uh, tracking climate change by uh, migration, because for the vegetation, for example, you, you may increase the exposition to summer drought because you start uh, taking up the water earlier in time. So you may be exposed to uh, drier conditions earlier during summer. And that's actually what we found uh, with Michael Meyer at ETH, he's a PhD student in a recent study. And you may also increase the risk of uh, damaging spring frost. And not saying also that being earlier, it's okay, you, you can track the, the climate, but you are also in a, a shorter day length. So it's also quite different uh, than a later periods. Okay, and, but to understand why trees need to be highly plastic or why the phenology is highly plastic, when you put a population in another environment, you will always shift the phenology by quite a lot. And we have to understand that if um, the trees are a long living organisms, so they have to, to be highly phenological, uh, uh, highly plastic in terms of phenology. Yeah, it's, uh, it shows the distribution of European bleach and the climate from the south to the north or to the eastern part of the distribution with the amplitude of temperature. And if you look at the absolute minima, for example, we don't, I don't want to go into details, but if you look among sites, so what is the amplitude among sites for a given day uh, over 100 years? If you take the same day and you look at the maximum amplitude you get from the south to the north or from the east to the west, you are around 10 degrees of uh, difference in amplitude over the entire distribution. But if you look at a given site for 100 years for the same day, so every year you take the same day and you look at the amplitude you may have over 100 years, you have even a higher uh, difference in temperature. So for a given day, you, you have around uh, 15 to 20 degrees of difference of an amplitude, which means that a tree that stays in the same place has to be highly plastic to temperature. So this is very basic, but it's good to understand it and uh, it helps to understand why the trees has to to be so plastic with temperature. Okay, uh, what about the phenological shift due to global warming? Um, so here yeah, it's a longest series of phenological observations we have on Earth. So it's more than 1,000 years of observation in Kyoto in Japan. This is a blooming of a cherry. And it nicely shows that uh, the phenology is fairly stable with quite some variation over the centuries, but you, you have a nice pattern or you see clearly the pattern of climate warming since the 19th century. And uh, actually this year was the earliest uh, cherry blossom uh, over the 1,200 years. It was on the day 86. So clearly the vegetation is changing due to global warming. And yet it's another example from remote sensing from uh, Yele. Uh, Lever, a postdoc from the Blue Green Biodiversity Project. Uh, he, he used remote sensing data from the two last decades and it shows in red uh, an advance of the vegetation uh, and in blue a delay. So overall we have most, uh, mostly an advance of the vegetation over the globe. And the same in, in spring in Switzerland, the spring are coming earlier and earlier. Yeah, the spring index published by Meteo Suisse. And since like 19, the end of 1980s, we have clearly always almost a very early spring. And this index comes from the phenology of different plants and trees. So we have about two weeks uh, earlier phenology since 1970. Uh, it's not only plants and all animals here, yeah, it's for birds. It's a study uh, published in PNAS in 2020. Um, for more than 70, 73 boreal birds. Uh, they took the bird ringing as a proxy for uh, hatching, 
and they found that the beginning and the end of the breeding period has also shifted earlier quite to some extent so about two three days earlier per decade um, yeah i don't want to go into detail there is a long distance migration bird or the resident birds but we don't need to go into that details uh, it just i pick up some examples of different taxonomic groups for insects it's the same uh, yeah, it's a kind of uh, review or or study that use um, physiological data of uh, a lot of insects more than 600 uh, species and they predicted uh, based on physiological um, um, parameters uh, to environmental change how the phenology would have changed over the years uh, and also the number of generations what they found is that the phenology is also shifting earlier whatever the latitudes and the number of generation, that's very important for insects, the number of generation is predicted to increase quite tremendously. Um, that confirms also studies from uh, pest uh, insects like uh, the bark beetle. Um, so yeah, it's a study from Jacobi in, in v at VSL uh, showing also the number of generation, how is it predicted to increase in the future? Normally in the plateau, in the Swiss plateau, we have one to two generations per year, but uh, it would be it would become more and more uh, around two or three generations per year um, because the life cycle of the insect accelerates, which means it makes also more pressure for, for the trees at low lands. Okay, let's move on to my very last part, uh, which is uh, um, more uh, my recent um, uh, research focus, I would say, uh, how the phenological shift may influence species coexistence. And let's take an example from uh, the same taxonomy group. If we, we can use two frogs, so it's a recent study in ecology letters. Um, you are here on the left, you have a frog which is more competitive. The big frog is more competitive than the small one when the, they emerge at the same time. So when the phenology is at the same time. And phenology shift after warming may help to uh, make a better balance of this competition between these two species. If the small frog shift earlier more than the biggest frog, frog uh, then you can increase or even restore the competitive symmetry between the two species because it's an advantage to, to get earlier and get the food before the other take all the food. But you may have the opposite case where you have uh, species that have quite similar competitiveness at the beginning when they have similar phenology. And let's say um, the phenology of the left frog is advancing more than the phenology of the right frog then it would increase its competitiveness over the, the other species. So it could be very complex. Here I used only two species within the same taxa. Um, so again, if we stay within taxonomy group, here I take the example of trees. Um, I extracted from my different studies and other studies, uh, the sensitivity of trees to spring warming every species even if they coexist together they have different uh, phenological sensitivity to warming and this is illustrated here uh, the species on the top like ash tree oak or silver fir they are able to shift their phenology quite a lot per degree of warming so here for example ash and oak they can uh, advance a leaf out date by about a week or 6.6 days, every one degree increase. While some species like sorbus, alnus, or even beech uh, has a very low sensitivity to warming. So only two days per degree of warming. So like three times less than the oak. And that make that could make a difference in the competition among the species, because of course it would be an asset to track more the climate change and the earlier to take earlier the water, the nutrients, and even the light to outcompete the other species at the juvenile stage, for example. And they are not only different in sensitivity to spring warming, but also to winter warming or to winter temperature. It's another study from um, Frederick Baumgarten, a PhD student here. 
he, uh, make, he made an experiment in climate chambers where he collected twigs of trees and he placed them at different chilling exposure. So one week, three weeks, six weeks, and 18 weeks under cold temperature. And then he placed them back to uh, 20 degrees and look at how much time they need, how much days they need at 20 degrees to bad burst. It's a kind of a classical measurement to, to understand the, or to quantify the dormancy depth. And so we don't care too much about the different colors, but more the shape of the curves. And I took the example of four species. You see clearly like uh, maple and uh, lime tree, Tilia cordata. They have high chilling requirements, so they need quite a lot of cold temperature. But and just uh, uh, under a few weeks, it managed to release totally the dormancy. So you have a fast dormancy release. Um, while some species like Fagos sylvatica, oops, I cannot change. Uh, uh, so beach has intermediate chilling requirement and very slow dormancy release. And oak is uh, has a very low chilling, so it's a different scale and the slow dormancy release. So every species has also kind of different strategy uh, to cope with winter and spring warming, which means that the ranking among species, it's the ranking, uh, the sequence of the species, how they flush in the field on the right. And then under different chilling conditions, uh, under different winter temperature. So when you have warmer temperature in winter, you totally change the sequence of the species. So you have a big mess in the ranking here uh, with the arrows going into all directions. And that's also what you find by using in-situ data with a Marsham family record. It's the longest European series uh, of phenological observations. We have more than 200 years with some species flashing late. It's in the south of UK and some species flashing quite early. And if you calibrate a model and then predict in the future how the, the sequence of the species will change, again, you, you can change the ranking of all the species because they have different sensitivity to warming. So that will make a difference in the competition. Um, I hope I'm not too long. I'm almost at the end. I um, make it a bit more complex. And now I, uh, I look at across trophic levels. I use only very simple models still, a bird and a caterpillar. At the, in 1980s, there was a study showing that that bird um, uh, laid the eggs in late April and uh, uh, the eggs hatching date was in mid-May. And that matched very well with the uh, abundance of, uh, of caterpillars because the food peak uh, need matched perfectly the abundance of the caterpillar, uh, which corresponds between the date of hatching and the date of fledging. And uh, later, so now, today, uh, after some warming, um, they observed that the bird has shifted the whole phenological cycle by a week, while the caterpillar had changed more. As I told you, the insects are more sensitive, so it changed by about two weeks. And now the food peak needs doesn't match anymore with the peak food mass. Uh, because of this different sensitivity. So just to say that it gets very, very complex when you include different traffic levels, but there are very, very few studies uh, within ecosystems studying the, the difference among species. And here, coming back to my meta-analysis, I showed you for upward shift at the beginning of the talk. I also checked for phenological shift uh, in the Alps. And you also see that depending on the taxonomic groups, you have quite some differences. Uh, insect and reptiles, so like poikiloterms uh, uh, organisms that doesn't regulate their body temperature, they react quite a lot uh, to temperature. They are more sensitive to temperature or they can change their phenology more than other species. And again, we found the smallest changes in spring activity for amphibians and semi-aquatic insects. We are wondering whether it could be a, like a buffering impact of, uh, of the habitat maybe into the water. Uh, the, you don't have uh, as much climate warming than and at the air, especially because you have the snow melt. So you have always fresh water coming into the ponds, for example. 
And my two uh, last slides. Um, so across trophic levels, we are uh, investigating more and more and uh, with the post of, of yellow level uh, between airbag and VSL is um, using remote sen sensing data for more than 4,000 lakes over the world. And it checked that how the chlorophyll content has changed over the years as a primary producer for lakes. And the same for the watershed uh, vegetation. That's actually the map I showed you before. Um, and he would like to see whether they match or they mismatch the, or whether the lakes change more or less than the vegetation. And the next step, of course, would be to include much more taxonomic groups, maybe by uh, using infofauna or the network. That would be uh, really great. And uh, there is a, a PhD student that has started this year for the CRE PROC project. It's a SNF project. Um, together, we will check in three LVF sites uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, we will monitor phenology of different taxonomic groups. So we will monitor the leaf out of trees and shrubs, but also some early blooming herbaceous species. And then we will monitor general distinct insects like the gypsy moth or specialist insect by using the gas, uh, the Micola phagi, it's a small uh, diptera that make these gals on, on a beach, for example. And we will also measure the microbial activity of the soil um, uh, by using soil respiration as a proxy for microbial activity. And perhaps birds, if we find someone who is an expert on uh, detecting birds activity, which could be possible. We have a good master student who knows quite a lot about birds. Okay, and now I come to my uh, very last slide, the general conclusions. So in my talk, I, I wanted to show that the species are uh, reacting at the moment. They are currently moving upwards uh, towards north and higher elevations, but we can keep in mind at the moment um, much, at much lower rates than climate warming, except maybe insects or terrestrial insects. We have seen that the local extinctions have already occurred and not only at the rare age, but also at the leading age of species, especially in the mountains and perhaps it will occur more in the Alps uh, for the different reasons I, I said. Uh, the potential climate of the species is changing very fast. So they need either phenotypic plasticity or genetic adaptation, which I haven't talked during this talk. <laughs> Uh, enough time that we may have some questions about that. Um, so we have seen that there has been strong phenological shift that partly allow to track um, climate change velocity, but with some limitations. For example, for the vegetation, we get shorter and shorter day lengths. Uh, we may expose the plants more to drought and frost. Um, so it's not exactly the same that as tracking by uh, migration. And we have very different phenological sensitivity to warming among the species, uh, either within the same taxonomy group or among the taxonomy group within the same ecosystem. And I think that will likely shape or participate to, um, to change the future species coexistence. And uh, I would like to say that there are so far very, very few studies investigating how the phenological shift are affecting species coexistence within ecosystems, because it's actually very hard to get uh, together different specialists on different groups. Um, yeah, that was my last slide. I thank you very much for your virtual attention. <laughs> and I'm uh, very open to answer any questions. <laughs>